This week, join me as I rediscover a lost civilization in the high Andes of Peru. They built the largest stone structure in the Americas. To the Inca, they were the Chachapoya, the people of the clouds. The Spanish called them the Great Warriors. But today, we don't even know their real name. Who were the Chachapoya, and how did they disappear? Look at this. To find out, I'll explore their oh, cliffside wow. tombs, unwrap one of their ancient mummies, and get exclusive access to a newly discovered cave where their secrets may be hidden. Look at what we stumbled upon here. Can we uncover the remains of a lost civilization? We're digging for the truth and going to extremes to do it. Peru, land of the great Inca Empire and its dramatic fall to the Spanish conquistadors. But before the clash of these two great powers in the 16th century, there was another civilization that flourished in the northern Andes on top of the world. They were called the Chachapoya, but they disappeared almost entirely. In fact, few people have even heard of them. So who were they? and what happened to their civilization. To begin my investigation, I head to the remote high peaks of the Andes in northern Peru. No easy feat. From Lima, Peru, it's a 14-hour drive up the coast, then due east on the winding mountain roads to a town called Chachapoyas. Hi, I'm Hunter Ellis. This place is named after the lost civilization of the Chachapoya, who even today archaeologists know very little about. But in the remote surrounding area, they have left a few clues that are starting to provide some answers. Who were these people, and why is so little known about them? These are some of the questions that I'll try to answer as I head into some of the most inaccessible regions of Peru. My first stop, one of the world's biggest mysteries. 9,500 feet up in the Andes, it's called Quaylap. This ridge may look like a natural formation, but it's the outer wall of an ancient citadel. In 1843, an explorer found this abandoned mountaintop city. For almost a century, everyone assumed it had been constructed by the Inca. Who else but the architects of Machu Picchu could build on such a monumental scale? But those first assumptions have been challenged. I'm meeting the man who has changed our understanding of Quaylap, Alfredo Narvaez. Buenos dias, Alfredo. Buenos dias, Hunter. Ah, uh, como esta? Very welcome. Oh, what a beautiful place up here. I can see why this is referred to as the Machu Picchu of the north. Yes, this is an But if others speak side. of Quaylap in terms of Machu Picchu, the, the Alfredo doesn't. Part of the main... He tells me this place is different from anything the Inca built. Inca structures were made of irregularly shaped, tightly interlocking blocks, while most of Quaylap stones are uniform and held together with mortar. Inca rooms are square-cornered and rectangular. Quaylap is sinuous and rounded. It's also much older than Machu Picchu. So do we know when Quaylap was built? The radiocarbon dating is 500 AD. That's 1,000 years older than Machu Picchu. And this is the largest stone structure in the Americas. So who were these unknown builders, and why did they disappear? Alfredo takes me to one of three entrances to the fortress. This, to me, is brilliantly designed because it's so narrow, it controls the traffic in and out of here. Yes, absolutely. You have only one possibility to go inside, one person by one person. The entrance feels like it was built to keep out invaders, yet they found no evidence of warfare here. Well, this is it. This is the Quelap site. Wow, this is Quelap. Look at this. It's impressive and mysterious. Looters have been all through here. Few clues remain to tell me anything about its builders. Were they warriors or priests? There's just one place with evidence, 
the remains of human bodies in the outer wall. Oh, wow. Looks like a pelvic bone and some ribs and, I mean, how many of these tombs did you find in these walls? Well, we found 65 of these tombs. And how many individuals? At least 350. They decide. Alfredo says the bones don't provide enough information to tell who the Chachapoya were or how they lived their lives. To answer these questions, I have to find an intact mummy. And the best place to do that is to head even higher, to the tombs they built on cliffs. I'm headed to the cliffs of La Pataca. To get there, I take the only road from Quelap to Nutingo, then south an hour past Leme Bamba, where the road suddenly ends. Then I'll have to find a way to the cliffs. To help me get there, I enlist local explorer Peter Lurcha. I hear La Pataca is one of the best places to find intact mummies. It's so remote and inaccessible that most looters can't navigate these roads, let alone scale the cliffs. The road we're on is a dirt road. It's narrow, bumpy, and there's often sheer cliffs on one side of the truck. Woo! <laughs> we'll be on this treacherous road for more than four hours. Then it's another two hours on horseback. But it's all worth it when I see the cliff for the first time. Look at wow. that. Wow, there it That's is, the cliff. Lapataka. Peter says the entire cliff is over 1,500 feet high. And I've never repelled anything more than 100 feet. I can see a couple of the tombs up there. How many are up there? There should be far more than 100 all over the a cliff. Hunt? No way. Really? More than 100. I can see man-made platforms, ledges, and what looked like burial houses sticking right out of the cliff face. Peter tells me we'll descend to the natural caves about halfway down the face. But we'll wait until morning. So what do you think we'll find up there tomorrow? There should be some mummies. Unbelievable. Well, I'm excited to get up there. Tomorrow morning. Be a great day. Let's go. All right. Let's go. The next morning, we meet the climbing crew and hike 45 minutes to the top of the cliff. So here we are, top of La Pataca. To help Peter and me make this treacherous descent, we have one of the best mountaineers in Peru, Maximo Henestroza. Maximo has climbed Mount Everest twice, the second time without bottled oxygen. So I feel confident with my life in his hands. Because the cliff is so high, we can't repel by ourselves. Instead, Maximo sets up a system which gives him control of the ropes to lower us down to the caves. As if it wasn't dangerous already, the cameraman Rich is going alongside me, meaning Maximo will control both of our ropes at the same time. This setup is untested. Because we can only do this once, I'll be wearing a helmet cam. This will be mounted onto my helmet. The plug will go in here, and uh, I'll be wearing a backpack where uh, this will be recording everything where I am looking. So uh, if I see bones on a cliff on the way down, so will you. Peter goes first. Is he over the edge? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. That's the edge right there. Next goes Rich, our cameraman. Ready, Rich? Hey, tell me if we break. OK. Yeah, now, it's my turn. I'm scrambling through heavy vegetation on the edge of a cliff over 150 stories high. Maximo Henestroza, an experienced mountaineer, has my life in his hands. He's attempting to lower me to the cliffside tombs built by the Chachapoya. This is the risk I take to investigate the mysterious forgotten civilization who built some of the most impressive mountain architecture in the world. I'm told the mummies in the tombs below can provide clues. 
Rich, our cameraman, is already hanging off the ledge waiting for me. And Peter, the explorer who brought us here, is already in the cave. Communication is key. One small mishap or lapse in concentration, and we could be resting with the Chachapoya mummies for eternity. Should I go down the same side of that ridge or the other side of it? Maximo told me to lean back and trust the rope, but it's difficult because the brush is so thick. The soft limestone rock breaks off beneath my feet. My feet are tangled in the brush. The branch right here. I'm stuck. I'm getting second thoughts. Maybe this isn't such a smart idea. Finally, I get untangled and remove my feet from the ledge. Maxima lowers me to Rich, the cameraman. What's up? What's up? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, dude. You should see it. Look at me. Look oh at my you. God, I know. Together, Rich and I are suspended in midair. <laughs> so, I need a moment to take in the view. All around me, I can see platforms and obvious signs of man made structures. Oh, wow. I can see tombs everywhere. There's a circular structure up here. that are like little small rooms inside. There's more timbers from where they built platforms. And there's bones up on all of these ledges here. As Maxima lowers me further, I see that these warriors of the clouds have left a sort of calling card. Look at over here. We have a pictograph of a headhunter painted in red. And it looks like a Chachapoya warrior holding the skull and spine of his enemy. It's amazing. As I get closer to the cave, Maximo's crew member guides me in. Ah, yes. Pachumama. <laughs> Mother Earth. Hi, Hunter. Welcome to the cave. Have you been lonely down here? Peter <laughs> thinks this cave was a prime burial site for the Chachapoya. Now, wow. let's explore the interior of this cave. Look at this place. He leads me down a small passage. We're hoping to find some mummies. Let's see if we can see any remains. See anything? The bones? As we go further back, we don't see much of anything. I get the sense we aren't the first ones to be inside this cave. Yeah, check this out. Here's a, a newspaper. This is a sign of looting. Look at this. 1985. Some looters have been here before us. Looters come here looking for jewelry, gold, or anything of value. They're a big reason archaeologists struggle to study the Chachapoya. By the time they find their tombs, they're usually disturbed or even destroyed. Yeah, looks like you reached the dead end almost, huh? There's the end. The dark passageway leads okay. us nowhere. But on the way out, I notice a platform that looks man-made. All right, let's head over this way. Similar to what I saw on the cliff. Here, I'll take a peek. Let's see what we see. Oh, wow. Definitely several some bones up there. Yeah, some several individuals up here. I see at least three skulls, a vertebrae, some ribs, more femurs. Tell me what you think. It's, there's mortar. Oh, uh, there's mortar right up in there. So they would have. It built looks like we found a funerary monument dead. built to protect so mummies on the ledge. Layered in here, and so. This is definitely man-made. Let's go look over there. This is amazing. All of these bones here. Look at that. And I mean, that's probably the remains of about four or five individuals, do you think? Yes, yes, according to the number of scouts. And several, several But skulls. even here, the looters have beaten us. They destroyed the mummies. All that's left are these remaining bones. Looks like the looters are pretty good mountain climbers. 
But what about the Chachapoya themselves? How could a primitive culture manage to scale these treacherous cliffs? Repetting. Only when you get this close do you realize how many tombs exist in these cliffs. And, and you know, we're using this modern equipment, and yet they had nothing. They had nothing. Maybe some, some primitive ropes. And that's really a good question. How did they get there? Exactly how the Chachapoya constructed their cliff tombs is an enigma. Most of them are so remote and inaccessible, they haven't even been studied. But it's clear these people of the clouds had mastered their environment. They must have been expert climbers and pretty good engineers, too, to move all this stuff up here. Despite the looters, Peter and I haven't given up yet. So we descend another 300 feet to a ledge about halfway down the entire cliff face. On a whim, we follow it for 100 yards or so when we stumble on what we came to find. Whoa, Peter, look at this. Oh my gosh. Two mummies. Oh, yes, two mummies. And it's almost intact. I mean, you can see the cloth here and the flesh still on the bone. I mean, we found so little up above and, yeah. and yet this is down below, right? The base of the rappel. I mean, this is an incredible find here. The mummies are incredible. But even these have been hacked up by looters. Peter says, if I want to find an intact mummy outside a museum, I need to venture even further to places even harder to get to. He tells me about a cave north of the town of Chanchapoyas that was only recently discovered. Right now, there's a team of archaeologists surveying it for human remains. To get there, I have to go north past Chanchapoyas about six hours then back south an hour, up to a tiny village called San Carlos. From there, we hike. No, Domingo. We hired a Peruvian guide to arrange locals to carry our gear on horseback. And just before we head out, our guide tells us we're closer to a mummy than we think. Basically, we're at the end of the road here. Like, this is where you guys are going to head off and hike with the horses. Up to. Um, I've been here since really early in the morning, basically sorting out the horses. And there's a woman here who's been helping me out, just wrangling guys to get the horses for us. And while we were chatting, she just mentioned that she had a mummy very casually. So I asked to see it. I mean, come on in, check it out. You're not going to believe wow. it. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, check out the toes, man. I was blown away by the toes. Yeah. Wow. This is what we came Ask for. her where she got it. Can I? Yeah, no, there's a whole story behind it. One day they saw some guys walking down with a big black sack, and her son said that they looked suspicious, they were from out of town and stuff, so he went up and investigated and found out basically they had the mummy, so they took it off these guys. And ever since it's been here. Hace cuánto tiempo tiene la momia? About four months ago, she says. You know, she says she gives it candles, and it's her friend. She's given it a name and everything. What's her name? <laughs> the name's Juanita. Juanita se llama, no? Sí, yo le puse su nombre, Juanita. Bonita. Sí. Juanita es su amiga? Sí, Juanita. <laughs> bueno. Juanita se senta. <laughs> It's incredible. This is a small little place up in the mountains. There's a mummy in there. What is Absolutely what wild. Who knows what else is out here? That's the great thing. But the problem is, looters are everywhere. There is no time to waste. Hopefully, we're not too late. The locals tell us it's about a three-hour hike. I hope they're right. See where those rain clouds are? We're headed straight for the rain. <laughs> yeah, to the caves of Atupampa. Mama, go see the mummies. Let's do it. Let's rock and roll. Yeah. Let's go. Come forward. Forward. Hey, uh, Welcome to our office. Not bad, huh? <laughs> so, guys, move it slow. Keep it going. Keep it going. Let's go. Come on. Got rain coming in. We're all in great spirits, but the altitude is adding to our exhaustion. How's Rob doing? Rob's not doing so good. Rob's down in the lowlands where the water and the mud are. We're up here on solid rock. He should have taken taking a left at Albuquerque. And we're only one eighth of the way there. We keep pressing on right to the top, only to get some disappointing news. Well, we fight for. Two hours. two hours, and uh, it was supposed to be a three-hour hike, and now they say it's two and a half hours from here, <laughs> which means we're hiking at night. The higher we climb, the heavier the cloud cover. It's getting dark. We're on our last legs. 
we're gonna lose light in 30 okay. minutes. Oh, they say we're staying another hour yeah, plus out there. Yeah. Who knows if that's true? I'm not making it before dark. Yeah. Is reaching this cave really worth the risk? Our only hope to get there is to hunker down and put one foot in front of the other. I'm just following these muddy footprints right here of people and horses who have gone before me. This is not an easy road here. Well, as you can see, it's nighttime out here. It's raining, and uh, I have no idea how far ahead the cave is, but uh, let's keep pressing. We gotta think it's the camp. Finally, tent. Get inside my tent. I gotta put up my tent and uh, try to get dry because this is miserable. Finally, we reach home base for the archaeologists working at the cave. Within minutes, we set up our tents, change into dry clothes, and crash. The next morning, I'm up early, but our tent city is already abandoned. The team of archaeologists and anthropologists have left for the cave. My contact is caver Steve Knudsen, who will take me to meet the researchers. Okay. They've granted Digging for the Truth exclusive access to their discovery, the largest cache of Chachapoya human remains ever found. I hope these bones can provide insight into the mystery of this lost civilization. Up until now, the only descriptions we have of the Chachapoya come from the chronicles of the Spanish invaders. They called them fierce warriors, but how did they know? Did the Chachapoya join the Inca in fighting the Spanish? I hope this cave will answer some of my questions. Steve leads the way. This is an enormous cave by Peruvian standards. This is huge in here. Its ceiling is about 30 feet high, and it delves into the earth for over a mile. We take headlamps and lanterns to light the way, because in just a few feet, we'll be in the dark zone. It's really spooky, these human bones laying around. Steve tells me he first explored this cave in 2002 when he discovered it was littered with bones. He knew he'd stumbled upon something extraordinary. As an amateur historian, he'd read about the Chachapoya. But when he saw the bones in the cave, he was confused. The Chachapoya usually bury their dead in cliff tombs. He reported his discovery to Peruvian archaeologists. How did the archaeologists respond when you told them about what you had found? Well, at first, they just insisted that the Chachapoya never went into caves. They only put their mummies at the entrances. But I kept... Uh, <laughs> Insisting, no, no, we found stuff way back in caves, way back in the dark zone. Just amazing, it just goes on and on through here. Well, and imagine the processions hundreds of years ago with handheld torches. Hearing voices up ahead. Yeah, I think we are coming to our people here. After walking a full mile back into the cold and dark, we finally reached the researchers. Watch your step. Hunter, come on up here. This is the archaeological crew, and I'll introduce you to the rest of the guys. And... The crew consists of both Peruvian and American researchers, including Karen Smith Gardner, a graduate student in anthropology at Chico State University. Well, welcome. We are counting bones. This is the 48th tomb in this cave of the 62 that have been identified wow. in this cave. 62. And you have people from, from all over working this site, right? Yeah, we hard do. at work. Yes, absolutely. It looks like there are hundreds of bones up here. Karen tells me the cave has been severely disturbed by looters. So they're not disrupting the integrity of the tombs by counting and sorting the bones. Where are we right now? What is the significance of this actual location? 
They tell me I'm witnessing the first stage of a new discovery. They've been working for just two weeks and nobody has found a burial site like this before. These people were known for living in the clouds. What were they doing in a cave? The Chachapoyan are a people about which very little is known, really. Right. They haven't been studied much, and we know something about their architecture, their sites, but really the bones haven't been studied so much, and they can tell us so many things. I ask her what they can learn from bones. Yeah, we can learn a lot from bones. Um, we can learn about the diet, we can learn about the difficult environment in which these people lived. Uh, there's quite a lot of trauma that we've seen. So, I mean, we're learning that they're pretty, pretty tough people that dealt with a lot. Yes, absolutely. But we have found a few... That Karen tells really me she set aside a few great examples that tell a vivid story of who these people were and how they lived their lives. Gracias. All right, the things I wanted to show you are just over here. Wow, this is a lot of bones. It truly is. This is the largest collection we have in the cave. This pile of bones represents 79 people. In total, they've counted the remains of more than 300 people in here already, and they've barely scratched the surface. Let me show you what's really impressive about these people. Okay. These were tough people. They lived with some serious injuries. For example, we have here the top part of a tibia. It's your shin bone. Right. Now, a tibia should look like this. Yeah, that looks, wow. This that tibia looks... was broken. It appears to have been possibly even driven into itself. Driven into the itself and split? Yeah. yeah, and what's extraordinary is that this has completely healed. This is totally healed bone through here, and this person walked on this bone. I mean, so you're talking about tough people. These there. were tough people, absolutely. And we've seen a lot of serious breaks with serious healing in this cave. What else do we have? If you think that's something, I've got some head injuries too. Karen shows me other bones with telltale signs of violent trauma, maybe warfare. Yeah, these are all fragments of skulls. This is part of the frontal bone, and here you can see it's a big round divot. Oh, just like, a, I mean, blunt force to the head, like blunt possibly force. a sling stone or something? Could be, absolutely. It's something round. Um, but what, again, is amazing is this didn't kill that person. This is all healed. Wow. Someone took care of this person. Do they practice medicine of any kind? Absolutely. They were um, renowned as being very uh, skillful healers and one of the most interesting kinds of, of medicine that we can see evidence of is trepanation. Trepanation is an ancient surgical technique. To relieve the pain and pressure of a serious blow to the head, holes are drilled into the skull and parts of the bone are removed. This is a child, fairly young. You can see there's his forehead. Right. And right there is his... Uh, oh, wow. Yeah, I mean, the side of his just, head. And right there you can see the hole that was drilled. Amazing. Now this is amazing for a lot of reasons. There are 20 individual holes drilled around the edge of this, uh, which is the largest I have seen of this style. So we're seeing massive breaks in, in leg bones and arm bones and, mm -hmm. and, and massive trauma to the skull. We so are. these are people that, that lived hard, fought hard, they did. and yet they were able to survive. Absolutely. Um, they. They definitely had hard lives. So what does a cave like this offer you when it comes to finding out more about this particular civilization? It offers so much, especially in the hard evidence. What I wish it offered was more context. Um, there's always when Karen says context, she means intact mummies. The bones give them the raw data to learn about the Chachapoya lifestyle, but they provide little historical information. Mummies could provide many more answers. Fortunately, among all these bones, they've found one. All right, the mummy is just down here. Right down there. Wow, check that out. Uh huh. So what do you think happened to the head? Sadly, it has been sacked by tomb robbers who took the head looking for treasures inside or something. But you can see the hands are curled up in front, like in the fetal position. There's actually skin on the back here. Yes, you can see Even in its damaged state, hands. this mummy reveals a key clue about the Chanchapoya. The timeline of when at least some of them were in this cave. 
Without radiocarbon dating, it's difficult to pinpoint an exact time period. But Karen says that this mummy shows evidence of embalming. That dates it to no earlier than the mid-15th century. Before that, the Chachapoya did not embalm their dead. I'm fascinated. Why did the Chachapoya change their burial practices? Karen tells me that if I want to learn more, I need to visit the Leme Bamba Museum, home to the largest collection of Chachapoya mummies anywhere. The museum got its start with a spectacular discovery deep in the Andean jungle at a site called Laguna de los Condores. In 1996, archaeologists recovered 219 intact mummies from nearly inaccessible cliffside tombs. It was the first significant discovery of Chachapoya remains in over 150 years, a remarkable breakthrough that ignited new enthusiasm to study this lost civilization. I'm meeting the leader of the excavation and curator of the Leme Bamba Museum, Sonia. Sonia Guillen, Peru's Thank premier bioarchaeologist. When it comes to Chachapoya mummies, you're the expert. Well, come and see. She takes me to a climate-controlled room with shelves of mummies. Whoa. I can't believe my eyes. Now, this is an amazing collection of mummies. Are these from all over the region? No, these are just the 219 mummies we recovered at Laguna de los Condores. From one site? Just one site. So have you been able to learn a lot from studying these mummies? Most of these years have been dedicated to conservation, to just make sure they are okay, they're stable, and to build this museum. Really, the research is only starting now. What are some of the things you can learn by Karen's study? forensic analysis of the cave remains is still in its infancy. But Sonia's work is much further along. She has the data from multiple carbon dating tests, so she knows when these mummies died. They're about 500 years old. X-rays help Sonia and her team see what's inside the bundles. I'm excited. Up until now, they've only unwrapped five of them. This is a mummy bundle, and we are going to complete the unwrapping of this bundle today. I'm going to be just the sixth person to unwrap a Chachapoya mummy from Laguna de los Condores. This mummy has been partially damaged by looters. Now we're going to open it up to see what's inside. First, we put on masks and gloves. Get our masks on. I feel like I'm going in for surgery now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we are. Does this, to... so this slides, we slide it off the head first? Mm hmm. We'll slide it off the head and. She tells me to be very careful. The bones are fragile. Lift it Hold there. it by the shoulder here. Mm hmm. Okay. Gently, we fold back the layers of textiles and begin to see a person inside. Used um, cotton. Actually, First, I notice the hands. And it's not just bones. I can even see the skin. Oh my gosh, I can see this, the shoulder. OK. At this point, we are going to get him up. OK, okay up so right. slowly, slowly. OK. Are all the mummies placed in this fetal position? Yes. This is an Andean trait. In most Andean cultures, you will find this position. Okay. Should I just hold around the shoulders here? Check. Oh, this is incredible. And we can sort of keep on I'll hold it. moving the textiles down. OK. Oh, man, it's amazing. I can see the whole spine and the ribs. OK, now to move forward. Unwrapping the textiles is painstakingly slow going. This is the tricky part, huh? Navigating it around the uh, feet. Yep. Wow, this is the first time this guy has been out of his wrapping in over 500 years, huh? Yes. Yeah, no, this is about 10 to 15 pounds or so. And yes, yes. It's just unbelievable that I'm holding a chachapoya. But even more amazing, Sonia tells me this mummy gives us a window into their fate. The chachapoya only began to embalm their dead 500 years ago. Before the mid-15th century, they treated their dead very simply. They let the bones and skull dry out, then they cleaned, tied, and wrapped them in a cotton sack. 
But later, they began to eviscerate the corpses, tie them in a fetal position, treat them with oils, and wrap them in textiles. Sonia tells me the Chachapoya learned this mummification technique from the Inca at a time when they were integrated. What we have here is the mummy of a Chacha Inca of the time when the Chacha and the Inca had integrated, and probably this guy was one of the administrators of this province now of the Inca state. Well, this My long expedition amazing. finally yeah, pays off. Sure the mummies here easy. reveal that the Inca began <laughs> to dominate the Chachapoya. Now my question is, how and why? I'm traveling through the high Andes in Peru, home to a forgotten people called the Chachapoya. I'm investigating how their civilization was lost to history. On my journey, I've learned that the Chachapoya built the largest fortress in the Americas and that they mummified their dead and placed them high in the cliffs. I saw the largest collection of Chachapoya mummies ever found and learned that the Inca brought new mummification practices when they came to the high Andes. But my question is, did the Inca simply influence or did they conquer and destroy the Chachapoya? To learn what happened when the two civilizations collided, I'm meeting Associate Professor of Archaeology, Dr. Warren Church from Columbus State University. He told me to meet him on the Inca Road, just below an old Chachapoya settlement called Yalape. Hey, Warren. Hunter, thanks for meeting me up here. Glad you made it. Oh, you bet. What a beautiful place to hike. This is amazing. Perfect day. This section of Inca Road is one of the best preserved in all of Peru. Warren tells me that it's prime evidence of what took place here, for this was originally a Chachapoya trail. This particular trail is uh, incredibly important in a strategic sense. It was a strategic Chachapoya trade route and crossroads north-south and especially east-west into the jungle, a gateway to the jungle, really. And the person who controlled this really was the person who had a very lucrative business, and so the Inca wanted it. The Chachapoya territory was the crossroads of the northern Andes and the gateway to the Amazon beyond. In 1438, the power to the south, the Inca, began to expand their empire. In less than 40 years, they came knocking on the door of the Chachapoya. In fact, right now we're heading up towards Yalape. Up ahead, Warren says, is Yalape, a Chachapoya village that witnessed some brutal battles. And that's right up here? That's right up here. All right, let's go take a look. Take a walk. As we continue on the trail to Yalape, I learn that the ruins sit on top of a mountain covered in vegetation, much like Quelap. All right, we got prickers here. Oh, okay. You know what? I'm learning why this is the lost civilization, because yes. none of these places are easy to get to. Oh, wow. Check this out. This reminds me a lot of Quelap. Yeah, this is classic Chachapoy architecture. You can see the same shape stones, same building techniques, typical sort of stone frieze here that you'd find. What a great vantage point of the crossroads of trade. The Inca must have really wanted this territory. They wanted it fiercely enough that nothing was going to stop them. They were going to take it. They were going to absorb casualties in the thousands, but they were going to take it one way or the other in terms of siphoning. Faced with the onslaught of the Inca military might, most of their foes simply surrendered. But when the Inca moved into Chachapoya territory, they encountered their fiercest enemy. Why did the Chachapoya rebel so fiercely when a lot of civilizations welcomed the Inca? The Chachapoya were not typically accustomed to having a chief, a boss, an overlord, an emperor. None of this was familiar to the Chachapoya. These people were all independent. To actually see an imperial army marching on them was something new and totally unacceptable. Uh, and they simply fought to the last man. Each Chachapoya settlement was fiercely independent but they all shared a common foe in the Inca. And they had a distinct advantage, even against the Inca's superior force. And this is not easy terrain to fight in. No, no, it's, it's miserable terrain to fight in. Uh, and these people knew it, and the Inca didn't. Essentially, Inca fought battles in open plains. Here, these people were mountain people. They fought from the heights. They rolled rocks down. It was like uh, guerrilla tactics, almost. Guerrilla tactics, exactly. 
But if they had the home field advantage, how were these great warriors finally defeated? Did the Inca have more sophisticated weapons? So what were some of the weapons that the Chachapoya would use in battle? Well, they had a number of weapons at their disposal. The principal weapon here, probably from distance, would be the sling. And this was their weapon par excellence, uh, essentially. So this is a long range weapon. This is a long range weapon. This is, this is basically the Andean bow and arrow from the, uh, oh, wow. from the heights. This was, this was a killing device. I have to admit, it doesn't seem like much. If this was the Chachapoya's primary long range weapon, how effective was it? Did they really stand a chance against the Inca military machine that brought so many other warriors to their knees? Warren sets me up with a clay pot to see for myself. All right, go for it. As far as locking and loading, this takes me a while. Oh, man. Oh, man. Man, as, as rudimentary as it is, I mean, it's, it's kind of like a uh, a very primitive slingshot. It generates some serious power if you do it right. Oh! Yes! Finally! Congratulations. We were running out of rocks up here, though. Got your boy, could have used you. <laughs> this test proves the value of a sling. In the hands of a Chachapoya marksman, this weapon was lethal in mountainous terrain. From there, Warren explains, the battles would progress to hand-to-hand -to -hand combat. At this, the Chachapoya were just as formidable. Their maces were crowned with stone for bashing and taking the heads of their foes. Trophy heads were taken. These were displayed prominently, heads of enemies. If you took the head of an enemy, you took away their soul. You took away their power and the power of their ancestors. You cut them off from their cosmic connections and you really did take them prisoner. These people basically were born warriors. So if the Chachapoya were such fierce warriors that refused to surrender, how did they lose? Simply, the Inca were relentless. They would not take no for an answer and essentially overwhelmed them by sheer force of numbers, but not without the Chachapoya probably inflicting enormous casualties like the Inca had never seen in any other region. It took the Inca just over one year to finally subdue the Chachapoya. It was a monumental victory. The Inca now controlled the Northern Andes and the Amazon, solidifying their place in history as the largest empire ever built in the Americas. But for the Chachapoya, it was the beginning of the end. To guard against rebellion, the Inca banished most of the young warriors to the far corners of their empire. Every shipment brought the Chachapoya closer to obscurity. Yet the Inca, too, were on borrowed time. They ruled for only 60 more years before the Spanish conquest. Today, a Spanish town that bears the Chachapoya name is the only obvious memory of an amazing civilization that ruled the Northern Andes for almost a thousand years. But the ruins they left behind in the rugged terrain and the mummies that continue to be uncovered bear witness to these people of the clouds, no longer forgotten by history.